Guys, welcome back to Arsenio's ESL Podcast. I cannot be too loud because some people on the other side of these walls are going to be a little bit crazy and get angry if I get all crazy up in here. But today is a special day. As always, I have an international guest speaker, a teacher by the name of Laura. Yeah, you know, it's so hard. She just pronounced the name. It's like Laura. You know, so it's really good because, again, I can roll my R's because, you know, I got a little España in me. But nonetheless, she's right out of Belgium, and we're going to be going on a nice little journey today. So, Laura, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very excited to participate in this program, so I'm very excited. (laughs) Absolutely. So, for everyone out there who does not know you, man, I want you to tell the world who you are. Well, um, my name, as you pronounce very correctly, I am uh, Laure Kleis. Um, I am a Belgian teacher and I teach French and English in secondary school. Um, I am 25, or almost 26 years old, uh, just in five days. Um, oh, a happy early birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have been teaching now for four years and I must say the first four years were very exciting Um, as a starting teacher I had a lot of um, things to go through um, just to see how the work goes and and how everything is is going and is developing and uh, like that and I also just moved so comparing uh, the two lives it's it's been very um, interesting, I must say. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that's shortly who I am. Um, in my free time, I go for a run. If I have free time, of course. Right. The, but I like being busy, so that's no problem at all. Right. And I want to yeah. say happy Halloween, by the way. And you were talking about you like, you know, uh, you would go for a walk out in the woods. And I'm like, oh, my God, would you do that during Halloween night? So is that is that another one of the hobbies that you have, right? Yeah, actually, I have. Um, how do you say? I graduated for makeup. Uh, I did this uh, during my teacher training, um, and every year I would do um, a new Halloween character, which would be a skeleton or a monster, and then I would participate in some kind of walks. Uh, they organize it every year to scare people. Uh, so there would be people hiding in the bushes or in trees and they would try to scare you the whole walk, like right. the, the whole time. It's, <laughs> but it's very cozy and it's, it's, it's actually tradition here. It's, uh, haunted yeah. forest. Uh, like in yes. America, we have the haunted <laughs> house. It's a haunted forest out there. Oh, yeah, man. Full of it. It's, uh, <laughs> right. So you know what? We, right before we actually made, you know, put this video on, and before I put that or replay that record button, um, you were talking about Belgium in general. So me, I did, I, the only other uh, Belgian person I've ever met, he was, uh, what is it, a digital marketer online uh, living in Vietnam. And I yes. was trying to bring him, of course, onto my podcast. But again, you know, schedules and whatnot, that didn't work. So very, very happy that you came on. But I did not have the opportunity to ask him about Belgium and everything. And you, it was very fascinating because you were talking about the South, East, West and the different types of languages. So I want you, for everyone, of course, like myself, out there who does not know about Belgium in general, tell us about the languages. Well, (laughs) it's a very, as I told you before, it's um, kind of a complicated um, situation. And it has a lot to do with the history of Belgium. So we are quite in Central Europe. uh, And during history, we have been colonized by uh, the French, the Dutch, the Germans, um, even the Spanish have been here. Um, (laughs) But eventually, (laughs) we are just divided um, into Flanders and uh, Wallonia, uh, which is a French-speaking part of Belgium. Um, so I live in Flanders, which is Dutch speaking. Uh, we have the majority in Belgium, and then uh, you have the southern part of Belgium, which is French speaking. Uh, that's their first, well, that's their mother tongue. Dutch is my mother tongue. They have French as their mother tongue. And then you have Brussels, our capital city, which is bilingual. So you have to know both languages. 
um, to to understand everything there. You know, that, that's how it works. Um, but in general, Belgium has three um, three official languages: <laughs> Dutch, French, and German. Because we also have um, a German minority. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, yeah, and in some regions we have Germans. Uh, well, it, they are Belgian, but they speak German as their mother tongue. That's how it, it's yeah. But they are very. It's a small group, but in they are recognized as um, the German um, minority, and they are recognized as an official language is here as well. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. So that's amazing. Three official languages. I don't think I've ever heard that before in my life. Like, you know, being brought up in Las Vegas, you know, um, I realized that quite a few people, you know, what it came down to was if you understood Spanish, it could speak Spanish and write Spanish. Not only would you have more opportunities, but you would get the higher paying job. So the importance, how important is it to be bilingual or you know uh, trilingual out there in Belgium um here in Flanders uh we would try to convince our students that French is a very important language if you want to have a job for example in Brussels um Brussels um has the European par uh, Parliament sorry <laughs> my uh, right, yeah. um and that is um, well. Some um, some entrepreneurs would um, like that they're. Um, oh, sorry, getting it all lost right now. Um, <laughs> some, <laughs> it's kind of a difficult situation. My life's all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so some of the employers. And they would like that um, the employees would um, speak um, Dutch, but also um, French, um, because yeah, that's these are the official languages. And even in our law system, when the Industrial Revolution was here in Belgium, the official language in Flanders would be French as well. So when you would like to become a lawyer here in Belgium, you definitely have to know French because if you have to look up some um, old material, it's all in French. All the documentation would be in French. So that's why you should understand it. And, and it's, yeah. So I wonder how many countries, you know, because being out here in Thailand, you know, I kind of look for what the future trends are. A lot of people, I think I spoke about this before and I asked, what was it? I asked someone, I said, you know what, what is the importance of learning Mandarin? Because of course, you know, China and then, you know, rapidly expanded and whatnot. But a lot of people would say, well, it's not so much of the importance of learning a language. It's more about what do you love? So, I mean, it, it's crazy because a lot of Americans, they just cannot speak Spanish, including myself, because again, I didn't live it. You know, I more learned yeah. it for a grade, which is the worst way to learn any language in the history of learning languages, you Definitely. know? So um, out there, and especially you being a French teacher and an English teacher, how is it, how can you uh, encourage some of your students to, you, you know, I don't know because I mean maybe some of them said oh you know well I don't really like English and then some of them would say well I like French more than this and that and this and so is there like uh you know is there like head butts in the class saying oh I don't really like learning English like some of my students out here in Thailand how is it there? Oh they don't like French at all because oh. it's a difficult language to learn yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. for them uh, because Dutch is a German language and um how do you say it? Is it a German language? Is it? Yeah. Um, and then um, French is a Latin language. Um, so grammatically seen, it's not always easy um, to learn. But I would always try to give them authentic situations. So to make them feel like, oh, hey, you can use this in, um, in a real situation. And the things you are learning are very useful. I think that it's very important to motivate pupils and um, what is very important in my eyes is that they dare to speak 
but they have to dare to make mistakes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I must say, so here in Flanders, um, pupils get really, they, we get a lot in touch with English, for example. So it's very easy for them to learn. They can watch movies, they play games, they, um, they can read on the internet, but it's, and it's very strange because uh, Belgium is a bilingual language, um, country, for example, um, but it is not that they get in touch that much with French. So for them, it's harder to learn and they are more afraid to make mistakes. And as a teacher, I think the main point is to make them feel comfortable in learning it, um, give them authentic situations uh, to not make them uh, learn things for nothing. Of course, I could give them many lists to learn, but then you have to think, uh, hey, what's useful? What's, what can they do with it? Um, should they talk about their hobbies, um, hobbies that they don't do or that they will never get in touch with? Or is it more useful to let them speak about themselves so they can express something? Um, and that's just a, a, little, a, a little example for it. Um, yeah. Um, so it's very, well, interesting to get more um, examples for them from real life situations. Um, yeah, it, it's and and also the the cultural um, the cultural part is very good as well, and it works motivating because a language is so much more than grammar and vocabulary. It's also, yeah. I'm glad. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, so glad <laughs> that was that. the correct answer, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of people, especially across Asia and the academic, you know, uh, uh, has-beens from like the 1940s, 1930s and stuff, or 1950s, whatever it may be, they still believe that, you know, academics are still the biggest driving force. But other than like the professional certificates that you need in terms of medical school, dental school and whatnot, be the, the majority of these certificates and degrees that are being offered in universities right now will become obsolete because now people are understanding that you know <laughs> you don't have to become you don't have to go to university to become successful you know what i mean so a lot wow. of people listening to this right now they could actually hey well i speak belgium hmm, maybe i should start like a uh, a little YouTube channel and start teaching uh, how to get around Belgium or yeah, you know, speak in this language or that language. It's just all about yeah. ideas and it's more about skill set. So, oh my God, I absolutely, it's, it's kind of like with people <laughs> right now, if they, uh, what was it? If they actually created something that I'm doing for their own language in podcast form, boom, just like that. Like Belgium hey, podcast right? or Laura uh, Belgian podcast, speaking French, and they go from at lesson one, season one, all the way down, and boom, just like that, you would become the biggest one out there. So <laughs> <sighs> I agree. So again, going back to the whole grammar vocabulary, oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. So um, what else? I was going to tell you, I was going to ask you something else in terms of, so if I go to Belgium, what's the main language that they would speak? Because you said your students don't like speaking French. So would mm -hmm. it be Dutch? Is Dutch the number one? Yes. I see. Um, I well, in Flanders, it would be Dutch. Oh. In Yeah. Uh, if right. you go to Brussels, you would mainly see French. But actually, they should speak Dutch as well. It, yeah, I, it sounds complicated. But um, if you speak Dutch in Brussels, they should understand you most of the time. Um, but like, for example, if you, if you would go to a restaurant, uh, the menu should be and is mostly in French and in Dutch together mm. because it's bilingual. Um, but if you would go to, for example, um, let's say a city, uh, Namen, which is um, a city in the southern part, you would only see French. You would so, only see French, I see. Yeah, you are, well... It's kind of the, the France of the, the little France of Belgium. It, it's, yeah, it's right, right, right. <laughs> you must go accommodate your own country and speak another language you don't know about. It's uh, right. Yeah. 
And German, how about German? German, is that to the north? Um, <coughs> sorry. You're good. You're more with, um, well, uh, on the German border, I, or they would be more in the, um, also just, um, it's more in the southern part that they would be, um, but they are kind of spread it. Um, there is actually a YouTube video that explains it, and it's, uh, I think, Belgian for dummies. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> well, it's I guess very that's complicated, me. and it's a very fun way to explain and trying to understand what it's all about. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a crazy country, I but we have many different. awesome things here, so uh, yeah. Right, right. And of course, you guys are famously known for that Belgian chocolate. And you know, I've never tasted it, to be honest with you. It's so weird. I, but I want to try the waffles. Them. Yeah. Oh my God. But there are two types of waffles. Uh-oh. What kind of waffles we got? <laughs> oh boy, when you say waffles, I get excited. What kind of waffles we got? Yeah, we got the blueberry. Um, what we you got? We have the Brussels waffles. I guess you know them because they are world known. Uh, the Brussels waffles are kind of big and uh, very light. Mm. Um, they're very delicious um, but then you have uh, another specific waffle which is more round and um, there are more bigger pieces of sugar in it right. uh, which is um, a waffle from Luck which is another city which created another kind of waffle and both of them are mainly sold here when you would go to Brussels you would have well, the, the Brussels waffles mm. uh, uh, but for the rest you would you could go to an ice saloon and choose whatever you want it, it's yeah I see and that's the that's the fun part of, about Belgium we have so many different products and it's very hard to explain because they have very um, typical names from the region they are from for example if you would go to Antwerp Antwerp. Okay. Um, I know that one. You know that one? It's, because uh, <laughs> it, it popped up on my podcast one time. It was like Antwerp. I was like, where is Antwerp? You know what I mean? So I hurry up and Google it. I was like, wow, that looks so beautiful. You know, so yeah. <laughs> well, I actually created a cookie in the form of a hand, which is like kind of cookie in this shape. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a whole story about it because Antwerp, like um, in Dutch, we would say Antwerpen. Um, werpen is to throw, right? And legend says that um, Brabo, which is the, um, the figure of the city, is mm. kind of the city hero, right? Uh, the legend says that he threw away the hand of a giant. Uh, so, ant uh, is hand, which is a hand, mm -hmm. werpen is really literally if you translate it it's to throw a hand antwerpen and so the cookie is the shape of the hand it's do you know what I mean? yeah, I, yeah yeah fascinating it has a story i mean it has a story it um yeah and the Dutch um, language is something that I think I've only heard once, and that was from a couple of teachers. I wouldn't really classify them as teachers, but uh, it was from a couple of guys that you know I was in the vicinity of and whatnot. And um, yeah, so it, that, man, that Dutch language is just fascinating in its own. I wonder how much more difficult. Um, obviously, that's less difficult than French. So French yeah. is just full on, just really difficult, huh? It is difficult. Um, and you speak three or four? Three. Um, I speak five languages. Holy Jesus. Okay, so what's the, what, what's, <laughs> what's the other one? That and I'm, very, I'm very bad in math. So I speak Dutch, which is my mother tongue. Okay. Uh, my second language would be French. The third okay. one would be English. Then you have German. And then in the fifth year of secondary school and in the sixth year, I took Spanish lessons. There you go. Okay, because once you learn English, Spanish is easy. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, the conjugations and, for, and whatnot are crazy, but yeah. Yeah, but in, I must say Dutch is a difficult language um, to learn as well because we have strange uh, grammatical rules. And in the most languages, you would have like a certain structure to, um, to form a sentence. 
but when I was talking to one of the the Dutch teachers, um, they would say that the students find it very hard to learn uh, the structure because, well, you would say it's their mother tongue, so they you, they should be used to it, but they use a lot of um, internet language so like abbreviations contractions and so they don't know how to spell most of the words it's crazy <laughs> and um just to give you another example we have this strange uh dt rule uh which for certain verbs if you conjugate them you have to add a t uh depends on where the subject of the sentence is um and sometimes you have to add it, sometimes you don't. If you have English verbs, uh, for example, to download is just downloading here in Dutch. Um, so it, they are kind of difficult to, um, to conjugate. Mm. Um, so I, I would definitely prefer the French verbs because you can, you just have a certain rule and, and um, I, I can imagine that some pupils have difficulties in learning their own mother tongue. <laughs> right. <laughs> but wait, 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 wait. But yeah. see, I had that experience back in sophomore year of high school when, you know, my uh, my teacher, Mr. Blackmer, he was teaching us like, what, what is it? Oh my God, of course, the adjective, adverb, verb, noun, all that stuff. And I'm like, wait, I haven't seen any of this since we sung a song. And you know, we, it, that was back in like second grade. So what the hell is this? It took a full day and a girl by the name of Oneida, whose native tongue is Spanish, to teach me exactly, okay, so this is a subject because you, of course you got your personal pronouns, after that you need your verb, and then of course you got prepositional phrases and objects, oh my goodness gracious. So I've had difficulty. And when you get to the more advanced levels, especially when I'm teaching on my podcast and stuff, Oh, I'm like, okay, this is difficult. And especially with TOEFL. TOEFL is a pain in the ass beyond belief. So, uh, ah, nonetheless, oh my God. Okay, so. You feel the pain, you feel the pain. <laughs> oh, I feel the pain. I feel the pain all over myself. I'm telling you, it's all over my body. It's in, it's out. It's on a constant basis. I don't know what to do. So I just try to just harvest all of it. <laughs> it's Halloween anyway, so it's uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so oh my god, and it's funny because now I'm um, I'm about what five six hours ahead of you, so I'm literally in November right now, and you are 24 minutes left in good old Halloween. So yeah. that's so funny how this world works. So now let me here we go. I'm gonna throw some collaborative speaking task at you because this is a nice little exercise that I want to bring a lot of people on to do and whatnot. So. I'm gonna ask you just a few questions, and this is really good, especially for, um, what is it, IELTS speakers, IELTS part three, um, and especially even in the IELTS part two, and so this will relate to a lot of people, and it's just some good fun that we have. So, who has had the greatest influence in your life? Um, it would be my grandmother, definitely. Okay. She is just a phenomenal woman and i respect her so much um she is somebody who uh takes care of everyone uh for example um well the first time she lost her mother and uh, at a very young age mm -hmm. so she had to take care of the rest of the family um and later on her husband her own children um, they had a lot of animals as well, and now she takes care, uh, she's 85, and she takes care of um, stray cats, um, so the, the cats that are left behind somewhere in the neighborhood, she gives them food and she takes care of them, and so she has this uh, stove in her uh, living room, and during the winter, her living room would be like full of cats <laughs> just in front of the stove just to keep warm and it's just <laughs> such 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 a beautiful um thing and she is such an example for many people it's uh, i i cannot i cannot even express how much she does to me it's uh yeah she always gives you the feeling that um 
she believes in you. Like when I was going to China, um, I went to China on a summer camp. Here we go. Uh, as a teacher, uh, but I don't speak Chinese. I was just there to um, go with the Dutch students. Mm -hmm. um, and she would whisper to me like, oh, you really have to come back because we need you here. Uh, because this would be the first time I would leave Europe, <laughs> which was a very exciting moment for everyone in the family. So it was, um, yeah, it was exciting. And she was just so sweet. She's adorable. That's, yeah, she has the greatest influence in my life. A, one, a wonderful person who gives back. I love these people that, um, especially that help the animals, the stray animals, the homeless animals out there that do not have shelter, especially yeah. here in Thailand. Um, there are a lot of people who take care of stray dogs and there are people who do completely horrible things. But nonetheless, I yeah. love to see that type of giving, you know, giving back to humanity in general, extremely important. So Oh, that's awesome. So, okay. So speaking of travels, the next question, you went to China. So I'm yeah. going to ask you, where have you traveled to where, where you would recommend someone else going there? Um, it would be Sweden. Um, oh, it's Sweden. Kind of, yeah, it's, um, I love nature. Um, this house, well, this is the kitchen, so it's not full of plants, but if you go to the garden and the living room, it's like full, it's kind of a jungle in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I like uh, Sweden because you can just put up a tent and go to the campfire. And last summer I went there um, and I met wonderful people it's been such a wonderful experience because here in Belgium I don't think um, people are very quiet in the street so if you're waiting for your bus um, well let's say if you go abroad people would talk to each other uh, while waiting for the bus and in Belgium that's not really the case or at least not here in Flanders I think it's all people are more on their own uh -huh. um, Sounds like Thailand. I think that's just the Belgian way of life. I think it's mm. not my way of life. I like talking. <laughs> but um, in Sweden, it was completely different. And you are completely surrounded by nature because 70% of um, Sweden is forests. Um, nature is breathtaking. Um, and I remember um, seeing nature from a canoe was just one of the best moments I had in my life. It's seeing the sunset from, uh, from the water surface and, and just have a night swim in a lake, for example. It, it's, I would definitely recommend to go there. Yeah. You know, the Nordic countries, man, I know that they have so much serenity and so much beauty in them. That's why I've always thought about going to Sweden, but again, it being very drab during the winter uh, and yes. it's like 20 hours of night, apparently. So you get four hours of daytime. If you go to the north, yes, it would be. But if you would go to the south, with, for example, Stockholm and then the lower, um, it would be okay. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. But you oh, can definitely God. tell, for example, if the higher you go uh, during the night, it won't be completely dark but still dark enough. I guess it depends on which time you were going, but during the summer holiday, it, it should be okay. Right. Yeah. Wow, okay, all right. Those are some good recommendations, or that is a very good recommendation. I've always wanted to go there. I've, wanted to, I've been wanting to go to, um, what is it, uh, Georgia. Georgia, yeah. yeah I have been there, but I think many European countries have such a beautiful and unique culture. Yeah. So I guess that's where it all starts. It's uh, even in Belgium, I must say, it's uh, always nice to um, discover new things. Right. Oh, man. Okay. All right. And I'm going to give you this last one. How much do you think you've changed over the last three years? Whew, that's uh, exactly, a hard one. <laughs> exactly. I know. I know. I um, love this question. It is, I think, a lot. I have changed 
a lot. I developed as a teacher in the first place. I have been teaching for four years. So my first year of teaching was uh, chaotic. Let's say it uh, very, uh, that's a euphemism, right? <laughs> they teach you so many things during teacher training and then you start teaching and it's like, oh, that's not the way I learned it. So you have to find your own ways. And uh, I combined two jobs. At that point and today I still ask myself how did you manage to do that um, I tried to um, to let go more of the work because of course you can do and you can you, you can do so many things for so many students uh, individually but of course um, you cannot take all the world problems you, you cannot solve all the world problems for them right. it's of course uh, teaching them how to deal with situations in life which makes it more interesting because you can be someone for them but you cannot you shouldn't do everything for them they should learn to deal with most of the situations um, and I also started to work as a volunteer because I thought it was um, my time to do something for society here in Belgium. Um, and so I do voluntary work in a refugee center. Wow. Um, yes, I, Great. yeah, I, I just thought it was very um, interesting because when you read the news, you just get sad and, and it, it's, so I found the time to do it and I spent more time in nature. So it, I am more relaxed right now. Uh, I am a workaholic, so it's uh, right, right. Uh, I could work all day if I want to. So that's why I would um, do some more things or, or just try to let go of things because I know obviously when you do too much, it's too much. Mm. You have to take care of yourself. So self-care is the main word in my life right now, yeah. uh, I must say. Uh, when I was, well, three years ago, I, I didn't think about it that way. I was just thinking, well, I, this is, I will be working for the next 40 years and it will be, I will be the best and I will do everything. But of course, I learned that you cannot do everything. Um, a day has only 24 hours. That's the, exactly. that's the main, main thing. Right. And so that, that's exactly what I do. Um, I make sure that self-care is part of everything it could be the mental health it could be meditation it could be of course obviously me going to these gyms and pushing myself to the physical limit um mm -hmm. and you know just listening to different audiobooks to get different insights and revelations there's so many different things i do throughout the day and how has it been you like you volunteering at the refugee camp or refugees you know refugee center uh how has it changed you as a person? Uh, I met so many different people with different stories. And just listening to those stories made me see like, oh my God, I have everything. Yeah. And I cannot imagine complaining about anything right now because I, I mean, I have a roof about my, uh, above my head, I have a phone, I have a computer, I have internet, wherever I want. I can cross borders whenever I say, okay, tomorrow I will go to London, I will just go to Brussels, take the train and in two hours I will be there. Um, there are actually no limits. And I think as a voluntary worker, I now realize that it, didn't came for nothing. I mean, it, it's, I am a very lucky person, I must say. And it's, uh, as a teacher, I come in contact with, um, with pupils that live in um, very bad situations. So it, it's, I think it's very important to learn from them because as I am very um, convinced that I can learn so much from other people. Um, and that's how it actually changed me. I, yeah, you could, you could be very emotional there. I mean, if you hear all the stories, you think this is too much. And the positivity of those people, they are the most friendly people in the world, I must say. 
um, it, it's whenever you enter that place, it's, it feels like family, actually it does. And I've only been there for like a couple of weeks and, and it still feels like whenever I enter, it's like, oh, Laura, you're back. And it, it's, yeah, they're, they're very uh, fun to see. So It's a beautiful yeah. thing. Like even when you go to some of these African countries, I've seen, you know, people like Neil, Don Neil Donald Walsh. I think he's an author. He's a hell of a spokesperson. Um, and he went to, oh, I forgot where it was. I think it had to be Ghana. And when he yeah. went there, he said he was looking inside of some of these huts that were in infest, like lion infested areas. And he said that, you know, they didn't have windows, didn't have a door, didn't have this, didn't have that. And he said he felt such a pain within him. And then he mm -hmm. realized he was the one that was poor. It's really weird to dive deep, deep, deep inside of the feelings of an individual when they're experiencing yeah their surroundings and whatnot, because he saw these kids playing, jumping, singing. And then this is the whole trend with the whole first world problems thing, but there's no such thing as first world, second world, third world, no. It's just whatever you see reality as, because he saw reality from a different perspective. And that reality ended up, you know, him realizing, oh my God, I think I am the one that's poor. I think I'm the one that's, you know, it, it, it's just amazing, you know? So, I mean, a lot of people in some of these countries in the Western Africa, Sao Tome and Principe, uh, Angola, they are happy, unbelievably happy. They live life, they do this, they do that, you know, that. And we kind of have a tendency of being very ungrateful and taking life, you know, life for granted. So, oh man, I would recommend that for anyone. That's of course, that's why I, um, I'm going to kickstart that uh, the Arsenio Buck Foundation because, of course, I want to give back to as many people as I possibly can, you know, so. It's a very beautiful thing. It's yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Laura. If there's anything else you want to share with the people out there in the world, what is it? It could be in terms of language. It could be in terms of anything that's uh, freshly on your mind. Oh, um, I would say just try to enjoy and and to to live your life the way you want to live um as a teacher i think uh, many students are just learning to learn because um why because because getting uh, great marks is, is very important but you have um if i didn't like teaching i wouldn't be as enthusiastic as i would be now so you just do the things you love doing and that will give you a very good head start in life. It's, uh, well, yeah, just enjoy. Awesome. That's the best thing, I guess. And of course, learn languages because they are very important. Um, that, and I think awesome. the people who like Singapore, Singapore, they're very, uh, they're very tolerant of everyone. Uh, Aktobe, Kazakhstan, that's another place in Western Kazakhstan. They're very tolerant because there are a number and a variety of different cultures and languages that are spoken. With technology now and the internet now, people are more exposed to different people out there in the world versus 50 years ago when the world was burning. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, so now it, it gives you the ability. And so that's why, you know, yes, I know it's unfortunate. If you live in rural America, if you live in Nebraska, you're only around one specific people, but that does not stop you going outside the box and doing things and learning from different people and learning about cultural exchange to broaden your horizons, your life, and to make you more to a tolerant member of society. So I completely agree. I think that is very important in life as well. This is what I do during, for example, my French classes. I would say there is more, uh, there are more people speaking French uh, in the world than just in France, which is uh, a neighbor country of us. Um, and they're always excited to you just have to open your eyes and just, there are so many wonderful things around you and they're just, well, not too far away during a, of course, um, due to the internet, for example, there are so many possibilities and you just have to take them, just go for it. Uh, yeah. That would be the greatest lesson to share, I guess. Awesome. 
<laughs> awesome, man. Thank you so much for sharing this. And so much for coming on this Halloween night. You got seven minutes left. You need to run out in the forest and scare a couple of people. You know? <laughs> just go out and scream. <laughs> just start screaming like, ah! ah! And then at 12 a.m., just calm down and go back inside and go to sleep. You know? Yeah, they're going to be they're gonna lock you up. Right <laughs> yeah, you go to jail real quick. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Oh my God, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming on. And guys, if you like this, if you enjoyed this, please share it, rate it, whatever it may be. And again, Laura, I'll probably be bringing you back on in the future for some more collaborative speaking tasks. So thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. It's been a wonderful experience for me too. So thank you so much for everything you do. And it's, uh, yeah. You're very welcome. And guys, with that being said, man, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, let me know. If you know any other people from other countries, shower them my way. And I'm your host, as always, over and out.